All right, y'all can have a seat. Kids, you can head to your classes through these double doors to go and have all kinds of fun back there. Well, this morning I have the pleasure of introducing a friend of mine, Dr. Dave Mathewson. Dave is an associate pastor of New Testament in Denver Seminary, and please don't tell any of my other professors this, but he was one of my favorites. Don't let that go to your head, Dave. Uh, He has written multiple books about Revelation, his most recent being incredibly helpful as Nathan and I have been, have, have been praying through and preparing for this series in Revelation. We greatly appreciate and respect his approach and handling of this beautiful piece of scripture. Dave, we're so glad you're here, and we can't wait to see what you have in store with us. So please give Dave a warm, sacred grace welcome. Great to be here. Uh, that's a part I dreaded most was your introduction. I didn't know what you were going to say about me. But uh, uh, it's so good to be here. I, I pastored for seven years before getting into academic stuff, so I love getting into churches. And the last two Sundays I was preaching, so uh, most of October has been speaking in other churches, so I, I love doing that. So thanks for having me. And I'm thrilled also that you're uh, studying the book of Revelation. I'm seeing more and more churches doing that. And then they usually ask me to come and participate in that somehow. Uh, but I, I'm thrilled to see. I, I think the, the book of Revelation has such an important message uh, for the church. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of churches ignore it or, or they're afraid to approach it. And so I'm, I'm just thrilled that you're, uh, you're doing this. Um, let's open with prayer and then we'll, we'll jump into part of the book of Revelation. Uh, Father, oh, I pray that your presence will fill this room at this time. And Father, that you will guide our thoughts and the words that come from my mouth. Uh, Father, that uh, as a result of looking at just part of the book of Revelation, our vision of, of you and our, our vision of uh, who you are and what you desire from us would be expanded and, and increased. And Lord, I, I pray that uh, through your word we would have a greater appreciation for who you are and how you want us to respond as your people uh, to that revelation. Uh, so uh, we just commit this next few minutes to you, uh, to you as we uh, consider just part of your word. And as its author, we ask for your presence and your help in understanding it and comprehending it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So uh, why did you come here this morning? Uh, maybe it's just what you do on Sundays, you come here, or maybe you're here because uh, you came to with family, or maybe you're here uh, just because this is where you come to get your spiritual batteries recharged, or maybe you just come here to meet other people that you don't see during the week. And those are all good reasons, those are all valid reasons for coming here. Uh, but I want to uh, ask that question again, why, why did you come here? And to answer that question, uh, I, want to, I want us to listen in on someone else's worship service. And no, we're not going to play it over the uh, uh, speakers or anything. That worship service is found in Revelation chapter 4 and 5. And in reading that, hopefully we can better answer that question, why did you come here to worship this morning? And sometimes I think, at at least implicitly, when we think about uh, uh, worship and why we come to worship, uh, maybe sometimes we think, well, that's that's just what I'm supposed to do as a Christian. Or or maybe you think, uh, you know, somehow God is up in heaven and Jesus is up in heaven and they're lonely and, and, you know, we haven't paid much attention to them throughout the week. And now finally on Sunday, we come to pay attention and, and they're just waiting for us to come and give them our worship and our attention and our praise. Or, or maybe we think that uh, uh, worship is all about getting the music right and, and, and getting the order of the service just right. And, and that's important too. But why do we come and worship? When you look at Revelation chapter 4 and 5, again, we see uh, we actually have the privilege of listening in to heaven's worship service. 
And in chapter 4, we find John having a vision that starts the whole book. In fact, uh, the the rest of the book is going to kind of like spokes coming out of a hub. Uh, Everything else is going to stem from and come from and result from what happens in chapter 4 and 5 of Revelation. And in chapter 4, we see the beginning of this worship service. And John sees God sitting on his throne and all of heaven surrounding and offering praise and worship. And it says, they sing to him, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and who is and who was to come who is to come. And then they also sing at the very end of the chapter, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. And we see in chapter 4 of Revelation, all of heaven bowing down and acknowledging God's sovereignty, that he is the sovereign creator of all things, that all things exist through God's creative act and through his word. And all of heaven, I I take it that the 24 elders and the four living creatures, I think they are angelic beings that represent all of creation and all of God's people worshiping God and and focusing on the center of, of, of what is truly real, the true reality, God in heaven, who is a sovereign creator of all things. And that's why All of heaven bows down and worships. And they sing these songs of holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And they sing the songs of you are worthy to receive power and praise and worship because you have created all things. God is the sovereign creator of all things that stands far apart from his creation, that stands far above us. And for that reason, all of heaven acknowledges who God is through their worship. You see, that's basically what worship is. It's acknowledging who God is. It's acknowledging that God is the sovereign creator of all things. And that's why they bow down and worship in heaven. You see, the problem is we we live in a world that contests that. We live in a world that does not acknowledge God's sovereignty, that does not acknowledge God's existence, that does not acknowledge his worthiness of our worship and our allegiance and our obedience. And so chapter 4 then serves to get us to reorient our attention and to refocus our attention on the true center of our reality. That is God himself and the fact that God exists and he created all things. And that's why they worship him in heaven. And that's why God's people are called to worship him on earth. You see, whenever, whenever we worship, uh, uh, the, the Lord's prayer that we just spoke gets, gets answered. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Chapter 4 is the as it is in heaven part. God's sovereignty is acknowledged. God's kingdom is acknowledged. His will is done in heaven. That's what's happening in Revelation chapter 4. But the Lord's prayer is a call for that to happen on earth. And that happens when we worship. When we come together like this and worship and and sing songs like holy, holy, holy and, and acknowledge who God is. God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven. But there's another part to the story, Uh, chapter 5. Actually, chapter 4 is just the setting for what goes on in chapter 5. If if you've ever watched a movie or read a good novel, uh, you recognize that usually when you watch a movie, the first few minutes are kind of setting the scene. It introduces you to the main characters and the main conflict that has to be resolved in the rest of the movie. Or if you sit down and read a novel, the first chapter or so, again, introduces you to the main problem or issue that's going to be resolved and the main characters and the main setting and where it takes place and things like that. That's what's happening in chapter 4. 
Chapter 4 is setting the stage for what's going to happen in chapter 5. And in chapter 5, we're introduced to a new character. So we, we saw God sitting on his throne and all of heaven surrounding the throne, worshiping God and acknowledging who he is and his holiness and his sovereignty as the creator of all. Now in chapter 4, we find, we find God sitting on his throne and holding this scroll. And the question that arises is, well, who is worthy to open the scroll? And the reason for that is this scroll contains God's plan of redemption and salvation. This scroll contains God's plan to establish salvation and judgment and justice throughout all the earth. And so when John can't find anybody to open it, he weeps. Why is that? I mean, when you read this, this is more than just a nice emotional touch. But why does John weep? Because if no one is worthy to open the scroll, there's no salvation for you and me. If there is no one worthy to open the scroll, there is no redemption. If there is no one worthy to open the scroll, there is no justice in this world. And so John weeps. But at the end of the day, there is someone found worthy. And John is told it's the lion from the tribe of Judah, but in, a, in an interesting twist of events, John turns around. Instead of seeing a roaring lion from the tribe of Judah, he sees a slain lamb, a lamb, a lamb standing as slain, who is worthy to take the scroll because as the slain lamb, he has offered up his life as a sacrifice for your sins and mine. And because of that, he is worthy to take the scroll and set its contents into motion. So we're told he walks up to the throne. And, and think about that. Who, who can just walk up to the throne and snatch the scroll from the hand of God? So the lamb walks up and takes the scroll, and now he will open it and set its contents into motion. He is the one who is worthy to open the scroll and to accomplish God's plan of salvation and redemption and bringing justice to this earth. And for that reason, all of heaven breaks out and worships the Lamb. Now, when we, see, when we read this, I, I think we probably domesticated this chapter a little bit too much. When we read this, at least when I read it, I think of some big choir singing, worthy is the lamb who was slain. Uh, but I, I like to compare it more to something like this. And you're going to have to use your imagination a little bit, but imagine that the Rockies are in the World Series. <laughs> you have to use your imagination. Uh, I'm a St. Louis Cardinals fan, so they, they didn't do any better this year. Uh, but imagine the Rockies are in the World Series, and it's a home game. They're here in Colorado. It, it's the, uh, the, the, spe- the, the series is tied so far, uh, three games of three games. So whoever wins this game wins the World Series. They'll be the world champs. And the Rockies are out in the field, and, and it's the ninth inning. There's three balls, two strikes. The bases are loaded. A hit will bring in the winning run for the other team. A strike three means a Rockies win. And if you've ever seen a situation like that, and you look in the stands, people, it's, it's, sometimes it's deadly quiet. And, and people are doing this, and some of them are covering their eyes, and some turn, turn their backs because they can't stand to watch it. And then when that third strike crosses the plate... The stadium erupts, and fireworks go off, and people throw things, and people run out in the field, and and all kinds of things happen. The stadium literally erupts, and that's what's going on here. It's as if all of heaven is waiting in silence to see who is worthy to open this scroll. And when the Lamb goes and and takes the scroll, heaven erupts in worship. And notice what they sing. We're told in chapter 5, they sing, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, because you were slain. And with your blood you purchased people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priest, to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. 
And then they sing, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. And then finally again they sing, to him who sits in the throne and to the lamb. Now God and the lamb are on the same throne receiving the same worship. Be praise and honor, glory, power forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the 24 elders fell down and they worshiped. See, all of heaven breaks out in worship, erupts in worship, because the Lamb is worthy of that worship because through his death on the cross, he has enacted God's plan of redemption and salvation for you and me. He has, he has enacted God's plan to bring justice on this earth. And for that reason, all heaven worships the Lamb. So why do we worship? Putting chapter 4 and 5 together, we worship God and the Lamb because God is the creator of all. And through the Lamb, he is the redeemer of all. We worship God and the Lamb because of who they are and what they have done for us. So we, we don't worship because God needs it or because somehow, you know, he's sitting up there six days a week just waiting for Sunday to come so finally people are giving him attention. We don't worship mainly to get our spiritual batteries charged, although that's true. We don't worship just to come and gather with our friends and family, although that's true as well. But ultimately, at the end of the day, you and I worship for the same reason that heaven does, simply because of who God is and what he has done. We worship God because he is the sovereign creator of all things, and we worship him because he is the redeemer of all. That's why they worship him in heaven. And that's why we worship on earth. You know, again, when, when you and I worship, when you and I gather to worship today as we sit here, in a sense, we join heaven. We join the angels in heaven who worship, who fall down and worship and acknowledge God's sovereignty and who he is and his holiness and acknowledge the lamb who is slain to purchase you and I to be God's people. So whenever we worship, we join heaven. In a sense, a little bit of heaven comes down to earth. As God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven. But second, did you know, when you and I gather to worship, we anticipate a day when all of creation will worship. In Revelation 21 and 22, I think you'll get there eventually. In Revelation 21 and 22, we see a scene where God, this same throne in heaven in chapter 4 and 5, now is on a new earth and a new creation with all God's people, all of creation, offering praise and worship. And when you and I gather today to worship, we are in anticipation of that day when all creation and all of God's people will gather to acknowledge who God is, to worship God and the Lamb. That kind of puts, at least for me, that puts my worship in perspective. That people should be able to look at our worship. People, people should be able to look at this church and, and see a glimpse of life in the new creation. So when you and I gather to worship, in a sense, heaven comes down to earth. And we join heaven, we join the angels in heaven in worshiping and acknowledging who God is and who the Lamb is. And when we worship, we anticipate that day in the future when all of creation and all of God's people will gather and worship God and the Lamb on the throne. You see, we worship God because he is the creator of all, and we worship the Lamb because he is our redeemer. That's why they worship him in heaven, and that's why we worship him here on earth. Would you pray with me? Yeah. 
Father, we are humbled that you would invite us to and accept our worship. And Father, I pray that as a result of looking at this passage, we will see a glimpse, a, a, a fresh vision of who you are and who your son Jesus Christ is and what you have accomplished for us. And when we think about that, when we see that vision, Lord, we cannot help but fall down in praise and worship. We cannot help but join in heaven in worshiping God seated on his throne as the sovereign creator of all and the lamb who is the redeemer of all. Father, please enlarge and expand our vision of who you are and who your son Jesus Christ is. And may you draw us over and over again to worship, to give you the allegiance and praise and worship and obedience that only you deserve. In Jesus' name, amen.